Okay, good morning. Let's get started. Any questions? Any questions before I start? Any questions? Okay, so last week we saw the magnetic dipole, this current uh, carrying loop. In this uh, particular case, I have drawn it as a circular loop. It could have been rectangular. And uh, we assign to it uh, what we call the magnetic dipole moment. M, which is, in this case, current I times the area of the loop. And uh, that magnetic dipole moment as a vector points in the direction that you would find with your right hand uh, if you were to trace uh, the current. And then with your right hand thumb, uh, the direction of your right hand thumb uh, is the direction of the magnetic dipole uh, moment. So we will uh, discuss later the uh, physical meaning of this magnetic dipole moment. But uh, th what I wanted to actually do today is to show what fields the magnetic dipole itself produces. So last week, we solved a slightly different problem. We had the magnetic dipole inside an external magnetic field. So imagine you are putting in, uh, like in the DC motor, you have a frame and you put it inside a magnet which produces a strong magnetic field and we saw that there will be a torque applied onto that loop. However, the magnetic dipole itself is a current, carries a current and therefore it is bound to produce itself its own magnetic flux. And that magnetic flux I will calculate for an observation point on the z-axis. So my observation points on the z-axis. Uh, I won't do the general calculation of magnetic flux from a magnetic dipole. I just am interested in the magnetic field line, the magnetic flux line along the z-axis. To do that, uh, I will apply the Biot-Savart law. So this is uh, our uh, third example of uh, the Biot-Savart law, which says that if you have a current uh, ideal primed, and you are interested in finding uh, its magnetic flux at an observation point with position vector r, you have to calculate this quantity. very similar to the uh, Coulomb law that we saw in electrostatics. So uh, first of all, I have to apply the multiple steps I have uh, defined before. Uh, first, I will have to choose the coordinate system. So here I have a circular loop. So it's not uh, a rectangular or anything frame. Easier to describe this in a cylindrical coordinate system, so I will uh, express this in cylindrical coordinates. Second, I have to find this ideal prime that is given the current distribution, which is the circular loop. I have to decompose it into elementary currents. So how do I do this? I will imagine here a small segment of the loop. Defined by an angle d phi primed. And then the arc length that I'm writing here will be the radius of the loop times this uh, angle. So if we want to see this a little bit more clearly on the xy plane where the loop sits, this is the loop. Radius is A. Current is I. So there is this current I. And the current element, the elementary current differential element that I'm looking for 
is the DL along the loop. So if I start from a point here, I change my angle by a d phi primed. I'm writing here an arc length a d phi primed. And the direction of this current is defined by the phi hat unit vector. So this will be phi hat. And remember that since we're talking here about sources, uh, I will be using primed coordinates. So it is the uh, phi, high, uh, phi hat primed unit vector. So any questions on this? Anybody has a hard time to find those ideals? Again, it is an art of using your aid sheet if these don't come uh, natural to you or by intuition. That is, I have cylindrical coordinates. I am here on a circle. For the cylindrical coordinates, I have a line current. The uh, current uh, flows on a wire. It's not on a surface. It's not on a volume. Therefore, you go to differential length elements. And you will see differential length element dz primed, dr primed, and r d phi primed. So the length element here cannot be dz prime because my z coordinate is fixed. The loop is on the z equals 0 plane. It cannot be dr primed because I have a circular loop. So r is fixed. Therefore, that cannot be either. And therefore, the only one that remains to as a possible candidate as a length element is r d phi primed. And that r has to be the distance between these points from the center. All these points on the loop are on the circle, the circular arc. And therefore, uh, the, um, the radius is fixed. So dl primed will be a d phi primed phi hat primed. And uh, this i at, um, at a position vector Generally, the position vector in, Cartes in uh, cylindrical coordinates is this. But now my z prime is 0 because the loop is on the xy plane. So therefore, this will be 0. And it's a circular loop. Therefore, this uh, radius will be a. And hence, the position vector is a r hat primed. And let me use here the uh, yellow chalk to emphasize, make sure that this uh, is visible to you. A r hat primed. <laughs> OK. Um, so whenever you have uh, vectors like uh, phi hat uh, primed, r hat primed, it's a good idea to keep in mind their expressions in Cartesian coordinates. And um, that's what I will do here to complete this step. So I DL prime will be I A D phi primed phi hat primed, which is minus X sine phi prime plus Y cosine phi prime. And the position vector of this is a r hat prime, which is a x cosine phi prime plus y sine phi prime. Okay, so this is it. Yes, please. Um, can you not do the cross product first in cylindrical coordinates? Yes, yes, I will do that as well. Yeah, you can. So this is my next step. Um, so I, I will get to your question now in this step where I will do the cross product. Before that step, any other questions? All right, so now uh, I um, need to put this together. For 
an observation point. Uh, I have set my observation point on the z-axis. Therefore, the position vector of the observation point is z, z hat. And that is fixed. So now I will go and do the cross product alone. IDL uh, hat cross R minus R primed. So the ideal, uh, so ideal primed. And R minus R primed will be Z, Z hat. Uh, minus a r hat primed. So let me actually follow the advice of your classmate and do directly these cross products uh, in cylindrical coordinates without substitution. I have to be doubly careful here. First of all, let me remind you this, uh, the cross products in cylindrical coordinates. This is a small trick that I had uh, presented last week. When I have, for example, phi cross z, I can find it here. The next neighbor is r. If I'm moving to the right, it is plus r. So phi hat primed cross z hat will give me, and this is now the only trick that you have to keep in mind when you do this whole thing in the cylindrical coordinates without converting to uh, Cartesian that phi hat prime cross z hat will give me r hat primed. So, so this will give me z r hat primed. Very important. That is a unit vector that will be moving along the loop. This is the difference between primed and unprimed unit vectors. Unprimed are unit vectors that refer to the Observer, the observer is fixed. Prime unit vectors will be integrated over the sources, in this case, along the loop. Phi uh, hat cross r hat, you find it right here. The next neighbor is z, you are moving to the left, therefore the cross product will be minus z hat. In this case, I, the, the result of this cross product is a Cartesian unit vector. Therefore, I don't need to prime it. Cartesian unit vectors are always, everywhere, the same. That's the difference between Cartesian and non-Cartesian unit vectors. The z hat unit vector always points this way. Whereas the r hat unit vector points this way. So when you change your position along this loop, the vector changes. Same thing with this one. When you move along this loop, the phi hat unit vector changes. The z hat does not change. Therefore, when I get from this cross product a minus z hat, I don't need to prime it. So minus and minus gives me plus. A z hat is the result. So at this point, I will replace this r hat unit vector so that you see what it is. Uh, z, it's x cosine phi primed plus y sine phi primed uh, plus a z hat. Okay, and finally I need to calculate this. So the magnitude of this vector here. Uh, if you want to see it geometrically, what this vector is, it is the distance vector from my current oops, to the observation point. So it is this very vector. And you see directly from uh, Pythagoras' theorem that the length of this vector will be square root of a squared plus z squared. Because you have here the formation of a right angle triangle uh, with uh, this side being z and this side being 
the radius A. If you don't see this, then you can refer to this expression here. Again, replace r hat with its uh, expression in Cartesian coordinates. So now you have a vector with x, y, z components. The length of this vector is square root of a squared cosine squared phi prime plus a squared sine squared phi prime plus z squared. That is, each component squared, you add them up, you take the square root. So a squared cosine squared phi plus sine squared phi gives you a squared. So just like we uh, found from um, the right angle triangle, this length is square root of a squared plus z squared. So therefore, depends whether you want to see it qualitatively, intuitively, or quantitatively, that you have these um, options for calculating this length. So now it seems I have everything in place to write uh, this uh, differential magnetic flux density that is produced by this differential current element on the loop. So dB then will be for pi. Uh, I dL will be d phi primed. You see here I have a vector. That vector will be Uh, sorry, uh, z, not z, x cosine phi. Phi prime minus, uh, or sorry, it's plus a z. Okay, so this is my numerator. Denominator will be a squared plus z squared three halves. Okay. So now I am at the last step. I'm at the last step, um, uh, which is the integration. That is uh, step uh, four. What do I integrate? Well, you see in this expression that I have this d phi primed. That means that the integration will have to be done over the phi coordinate along the loop from 0 to 2 pi. So that makes sense. That's exactly what we're doing. We're breaking up the loop into those small currents. And now we have to go all around the loop and add up the magnetic flux density produced by each one of them. Uh, so. Total B will be, I take all the uh, constants out. You see here also this denominator is a constant because it doesn't include any uh, phi primed. And uh, now I have inside this integral from 0 to 2 pi. Plus a z hat. Okay. So. I can do those integrals uh, separately. You see, I have this integral of cosine phi primed for the x hat term. That will give me 0. You integrate cosine phi, uh, you get 
of from 0 to pi, you get 0 as a result. 0 to 2 pi sine pi primed, d pi prime is also 0. So you see that when I integrate the cosine phi and the sine phi prime in the x and the y components, I'm getting 0. So this magnetic flux density only has a z component. And uh, integrating this one here, I get 2 pi a. So the integral is actually uh, trivial. So all in all, the magnetic flux density of this magnetic dipole will be will be this. So the magnetic flux density you see is in fact co-directional with the magnetic dipole moment points in the z direction and uh, I can uh, in fact leave this uh, uh, pi on top just to show it uh, more clearly that now the magnetic flux density that this loop generates is proportional to its uh, magnetic dipole moment. So we have uh, mu naught m hat uh, divided by 2 pi a squared plus z squared 3 halves. So this is the magnetic uh, uh, flux density in Tesla that this loop will uh, generate along its axis. So we're looking at a magnetic flux line along the axis that looks like this. So we have a z-directed magnetic field, magnetic flux. Okay, so it's BZ. Um, was there any way to guess that we would have a Z directed magnetic flux? Yes. The right hand rule, yes. So basically, you could uh, find it from the Biot Savart law. Because for any elementary current here, at the observation point, this is the distance vector. So we know from the Biot Savart law that the magnetic flux will be IDL cross this R minus R primed. So it will be pointing somewhere there in this direction, perpendicular to the two vectors. It's a little bit difficult to find it, but uh, you see the cross product has to be perpendicular to both vectors. So that is what happens here. And the magnetic flux density from that one will be pointing this way. But for any such vector you have, it's symmetrically placed on this side. And if you repeat this exercise with the new distance vector, that will give you now a DB2 that is on the other side. Quite more difficult than similar arguments that we had seen in um, electricity. But you can work it out. And uh, then one can guess from this point on that if you add those two, it will give you a magnetic flux that points in the z direction. So this magnetic dipole reminds you of the electric dipole. And um, 
In the case of the electric dipole, just, uh, let me just put them side by side. So if you remember, the electric dipole is a system of two charges. plus q and minus q. Uh, the one is at uh, z equal d over 2, the other at z equal minus d over 2. In fact, in your lab you saw the concept of the electric dipole moment. The electric dipole moment was defined as Q times D, where D is a vector that points from the negative charge to the positive charge. So this was P. We calculated the fields that this dipole produces. So I continue here with the electric dipole. Uh, we, had we had done this calculation using uh, the potential, the electric scalar potential, and we showed that the electric field lines were pointing like this, always from the positive charge to the negative charge. And in fact, uh, they were hitting the uh, mid plane at 90 degrees. Uh, the full expression of the electric field of the dipole is in spherical coordinates, q times d by 4 pi epsilon naught r cubed, uh, r hat 2 cosine theta, uh, plus theta hat sine theta. So that is the electric dipole with its electric field lines. The magnetic dipole now, you see in electrostatics the source of fields are static charges. In magnetostatics the source of fields are currents. So we have for the magnetic dipole this current loop. that encloses area S. For that, we define the magnetic dipole moment, as we just did, I times the area Z hat. In the circular loop that we saw, uh, the area is pi A squared. So this is the magnetic dipole moment. Um, the magnetic fields that this produces. So we did this calculation for a particular observation point. Without any proof, I won't be doing the calculation of the fields everywhere produced by the magnetic dipole are, is beyond the scope of this course. But if we were to calculate them, they would look like this. So we, we calculated this magnetic flux line and then the rest of the flux lines look like this. So you see they are very similar to the lines that are created by the electric dipole, but now they are lines of magnetic flux, not lines of electric field. So this is the similarity between the two. The other thing is that these are open lines. They start from positive charges and they sink on negative charges. On the other hand, these are closed lines. So the magnetic flux lines are always closed because you cannot identify any magnetic counterpart of the electric charge. We have not been able, again, experimentally, to isolate a magnetic monopole. And that's why all these magnetic flux lines will have to be closed. They close upon themselves. So you see this here. They have to close. 
And the exact expression is mu naught i s by 4 pi r squared, r cubed, sorry. And then whatever you see here in the brackets, we have it here as well. So this is the uh, flux that is produced by the magnetic dipole. Electric dipoles are important for us because they represent how electric fields interact with materials. So if you ask yourself, why is this important? Why do we care to understand those fields? of the dipoles, uh, the answer is the following. <coughs> that if I take a dielectric, a piece of dielectric, and I put it inside a capacitor, You may remember what happens inside the dielectric. Dielectric means a material where all charges are bound. However, the charges being bound, they still experience forces by the electric field inside the capacitor. And the molecules will be, the charges in the molecules will be displaced. And we will have some, something like this that is inside the material, the formation of electric dipoles. So you start from the molecules of the material, you put them inside the electric field, and then the positive charges will go towards the negative plate, the negative uh, charges towards the positive plate. And that's how the electric fields interact with materials, because now these guys will produce their own electric fields. That is, they behave like electric dipoles. And those electric fields will affect the total electric field you observe inside the capacitor. And that interaction we represent it through the dielectric permittivity, if you remember. Because of this interaction and the formation of the dipoles, We had the relation between electric flux density and electric field inside a natural medium. Taking this form, you remember in vacuum, you have only epsilon naught. Inside the medium, you have also, also epsilon r, the relative dielectric permittivity. And what we call this product is the dielectric permittivity of the medium. So there is a deeper reason why we care about these fields. It is because they really uh, show us how electric fields interact with matter in electricity. What happens now in magnetism? Let's say you are putting a medium inside a magnet. So you put a medium like this inside a magnet. You see, we found electric dipoles in molecules in natural media. You stretch uh, due to the forces that are applied by the electric field on positive and negative charges. Nuclei, positively charged, and electrons, negatively charged. Can we find magnetic dipoles in natural media? The answer is yes, because of the orbital and spin motion of the electrons. So natural media, like wood, uh, chalk, uh, concrete, and so on, inside them have all these orbiting electrons that macroscopically look like a bunch of magnetic dipoles. So you can have magnetic dipoles that uh, form 
Ah, this one is actually the way that I drew it. The magnetic dipole moment will be downwards. Uh, here, the magnetic dipole moment also will be pointing this way. Uh, the magnetic, let's see, this way, and so on and so forth. So orbital and spin motion of electrons can be modeled as the formation of magnetic dipoles. So inside the medium here, you will have things that look like magnetic dipoles. And now I'm coming back to last Wednesday's lecture. What happens when you have magnetic dipoles, current loops inside the magnetic field? They will experience a torque. They will experience a torque. And that torque tends to align the magnetic dipoles, the magnetic dipole moment with the external magnetic field. Of course, that alignment cannot always be perfect. If you have a crystal, there will be other forces on the particles as they are spinning and orbiting. So the alignment can be strong, can be partial, can be total non-existent. That depends on the medium. And you can already guess that the media that we call magnets, they have strongly aligned magnetic dipoles and magnetic dipole moments so that the fields that we just calculated will add up and then you are getting a magnetic field out of the magnet even without you applying an external magnetic field. So the corresponding phenomenon here is actually that through the torque, the magnetic field tends to align the magnetic dipole moments. And we saw in electricity that the resulting electric field, you see, is contradirectional to the external field that created it. And we see exactly the same here, because if you follow the magnetic flux lines that we just calculated, you find that an aligned magnetic dipole still will create magnetic flux lines like this. So flux lines that go against the external field. So that is the foundation of the magnetic properties of natural media. You see, we started talking about magnetism totally disregarding the fact that the original observation of magnetism was done by observing natural magnets that were attracting pieces of iron. So we talked about currents. And fundamentally, what we see in natural media that are magnets is also the magnetic fluxes of currents. What currents? That currents that are formed by orbital and spin motions of electrons that equivalently behave as magnetic dipoles and give rise uh, to magnetic flux from the medium itself. So, I say all this to introduce the magnetic field intensity, H, as the second important field quantity in magnetism in units of amps per meter. And that is related to the magnetic flux density through uh, this relation that you see is dual to the one we had in uh, electricity. Mu naught is the constant we already saw in the Biot-Savart law. Mu r is the, mag the relative magnetic permeability of the medium. And you see just like the relative dielectric permittivity that depends on how this phenomenon of interaction of the medium with the external magnetic field plays out. Whether the torque 
will result in full alignment of the magnetic dipoles, partial alignment, opposite alignment because of other forces inside the crystal. Uh, we will discuss this a little bit more uh, next week. But for now, I wanted to introduce mu r, the relative magnetic permeability. And mu, which is the product, mu not mu r, as the magnetic permeability. So H now is the magnetic field intensity which is the ratio between B and mu. For example, in uh, the Biot-Savart law, if you wanted to recast the law in terms of H, then you would need to simply remove mu naught. So the Biot-Savart law recast with respect to the magnetic field intensity looks like this. So H is the second fundamental quantity, and you see the duality between uh, D, between electricity and magnetism, D and B, E and H. And uh, epsilon and mu. So very, um, a good way to think about magnetism is through this uh, duality, so that you can build on what we learned the first part of the course to understand the second part. Any questions up to this point? So for those two fundamental fields in magnetostatics, there are two fundamental postulates. The first one we have already talked about so the first one is gauss's law uh, which now says that if you take any closed surface and find the magnetic flux through it, that will be zero. So no matter which surface you choose, the magnetic flux through that closed surface will always be zero. In other words, the physical meaning of this is that we cannot isolate a magnetic monopole from which you can see the magnetic flux lines either emanate or sink. So always, no matter what closed surface you will choose, you will see the magnetic flux lines, the net flux to be zero. Whatever leaves the surface re-enters the surface. So that also means that divergence of the magnetic uh, flux is zero. And um, let me just put on the board here once more the meaning that is no magnetic monopoles. If you remember, uh, in electricity, the right-hand side of this law had the enclosed charge. So here we don't have any counterpart of the electric charge in magnetism. That's why the right-hand side will be zero. The second one is that uh, the second one is the Ampere law, not force law, Ampere law, not Ampere force law. And the Ampere law says that if you take a closed path like this, a closed path C, and you take the closed path integral, 
of the magnetic field intensity, dl, along this closed path. Remember in electricity, this closed path integral of the electric field was equal to zero. Well, in this case, it's not equal to zero. It's actually equal to the enclosed current, total enclosed current by the loop. What does enclosed current mean? It means that if, for example, you have, let me just give you an example here. If you have a closed loop like this, and you have a current wire I1 that goes like that, another current I2 that goes down like this, another current I3 that goes like this, the total enclosed current is found as follows. The way that you trace the loop defines through a right hand rule the positive direction of current flow. And that positive direction of current flow is found by your thumb, your right hand thumb. Tracing the loop, your right hand thumb points upwards. So I will call ds the area vector on the area enclosed by the loop and pointing in the direction indicated by this right hand rule. So in other words, currents that flow upwards have to be included in this equation as positive, currents that flow downwards as negative. And the enclosed current in this case will be, you see I1 flows upwards, consistent with ds. I will put it as plus I1. I2 flows downwards opposite to ds. I will put it, put it with minus i2. i3 flows upwards consistent with ds plus i3. So that is what we call enclosed current in Ampere's law. Last week we found that the magnetic flux density of an infinite wire of current i in free space is mu naught i by 2 pi r in the phi direction. Now that we have the magnetic field intensity, we can also conclude that the magnetic field intensity is i by 2 pi r phi. Okay. So if I apply Ampere's law on a circular arc like this, so if this is my C, the left hand side will be h dot dl i by 2 pi r phi hat. The dl on the circle will be phi hat r d phi. Phi dot phi is equal to 1. r and r here cancel out. So I have i over 2 pi times d phi from 0 to 2 pi. So this gives me 2 pi with 2 pi cancels out and the answer here is i. So that is Ampere's law. Indeed the current flows upwards. The right hand side should be plus i and this is exactly what uh, this equation tells me. So this is a small verification that Ampere's law holds. It holds unconditionally and how we will use this to calculate Magnetic fields I will discuss in the next lecture. So I'll stop here. Thanks for your attention. We'll see you in the next lecture to further discuss Ampere's law.